everyone's personal experience in life, day to day, month to month, year to year, is going to be drastically different for everyone because we're, we've been talking about inactive decisions, active decisions, how sometimes our autopilot takes over and we just do things subconsciously and we're just running day by day. It's a wash and repeat type of cycle. And even though, you know, I'm a, how can I say this without sounding like some sort of political pundit? Um, I am a 37 year old white American who believes in Christ, who believes in pursuing good mental health by engaging in physically difficult activities, taking extreme ownership of one's life, and basically admitting that most things in my life can be remedied by my own actions and thoughts and beliefs. And that empowers me to make changes in my own life. That last sentence is very important because this is something that I believe now, but it is not something that I have always believed. And September, apparently, I just saw this in passing just a few days ago, is Suicide Prevention Month or Awareness Month, whichever it is. I usually don't jump on stuff like that where it's like insert whatever day it is today. It's National Puppy Day. It's National Dog Week. It's National Pet Month. There's always something that's been designated for us that we should think about. But I will go into this subject because most of this podcast is basically like a personal diary. It is not advice. I'm not trying to persuade you or convince you of anything. This is just a productive activity for me to assimilate my thoughts and the things that I do. And maybe my family will care about those perspectives either in the near future or the late future, specifically my kids or maybe people that are in my circle that want to know why I think the way I think because at heart, at the very foundation of this, is I am a coach, and I use fitness to help people get themselves out of whatever funk they might have. Usually, it is a feeling of being physically less than or not good enough, and they want to lose weight, they want to get stronger, they want to get healthier. But those are emotions. And those are feelings that they're trying to figure out and make go away based off some sort of physical representation. Now, I own a CrossFit gym and I teach people how to do front squats and wall balls and burpees and stuff like that. But all of these are little tiny vehicles for helping people overcome their own mental walls and Sometimes these mental walls are fabricated subconsciously. Sometimes they are fabricated externally and we just adopt them based off of the media we can we consume. TV, movies, podcasts, all of these things can build our emotional atmosphere and then we will feel a certain way. Talking about suicidal thoughts and all these things, it is something that has come in and out of my life quite a bit from a very young age. And I feel like most of the time it comes into my mind during times where I feel like I don't have any direction. I don't know how to go about fixing the situation that I'm in. It's a feeling of, hopelessness and feeling like I have no control over anything and I don't know what to do. And I know myself personally, I don't know if this is a big number or not, but I can think of three people who have, you know, finalized that decision with an action of taking their own life and they have committed suicide. And one of these people I was fairly close to and I did not see it coming whatsoever. And it was a weird sense of 
um, you know, betrayal, um, massive amounts of empathy, sadness, depression, feeling like, is there something I could have done, could have said, could I have, you know, done something to prevent this from happening? And sometimes I reference that when I'm, you know, talking to anybody, talking to people at the gym. And I have spent many nights and long mornings talking to people for hours because if I get this sense that, like, I'm supposed to be having this conversation or that someone needs to be talking to me about something, it has nothing to do with me. They just need someone to talk to, and I just happen to be actively listening is because I think it's my job. And I've talked to my wife about this. I've talked to friends about this. I've talked to my kids about this. I will never finish the conversation if I feel like it's like um, a touchy moment. If somebody needs someone to lean on for a second. I've had so many of those conversations, especially being a coach and a gym owner, where all these things we do in the fitness world, they're rather trivial and convoluted. But like I said before, there are ways of overcoming obstacles and walls in our own heads. So we feel like, okay, we are capable of fixing this situation. If I eat a little better, if I exercise consistently, if I change my environment, if I change the people around me, it is probable that I will make some sort of progress in a positive direction. But if you feel like you don't have any of that, that's when the idea of just quitting, quitting life, quitting being alive becomes, you know, an option for people. And I have felt that twice in my life very heavily. And one of those times I even, this is when it gets a little more scary because thoughts are one thing, but when people start making plans on how they're going to do it and how they're going to execute this this action, that's when things get a little more real. And I've had somebody recently reach out to me and they're making comments through social media. This is someone that I knew um, in high school and we haven't really talked a whole lot since then. Um, and because we're so detached online, basically, this person is nowhere near me. I can't see someone's face. I can't, you know, hear them breathing as they're talking about these things. It's hard for me to gauge it, and I really don't I don't know what to do. I can only do what I can, just trying to communicate some sort of positive reinforcement behind those words that they're they're showing, they're saying. But I planned mine out very specifically years and years ago when my divorce was pretty thick and nasty and it was something where I felt like I had no idea what I was going to do because I felt like every every aspect of my life was just just thrown down the crapper. It was it was done. What I thought my life was building towards was not even close. It was over completely. My relationship with my wife at the time, my relationship with my social circle, my friends, my relationship with my kids. Like I felt like I was defined by this certain title that I gave myself as a dad, as a husband. And I was just like, well, if I'm not that, if I'm, I don't know how I'm going to manage that archetype of a personality. If this seems like the route that it's going, because I feel like I didn't have hardly any support whatsoever. Um, my dad was obviously still there and I ended up, moving back in with him probably close to a year after things started because we had just signed like this lease in Nashville. And then a few months after that, that's when everything went to, went to hell. And I started making these, these plans of how I was like, you know, maybe they're just better off not having to deal with the drama of this because I can't just sit here and not, you know, fight for the situation. But when you're putting your effort into something over and over and over again, and it seems like it's not going the way that it should, you feel like you have no direction. That's when you start making these thoughts appear in your head because you feel like you don't know what you're supposed to do. You have no reference for how you're going to fix this. And I made these plans 
And luckily I didn't execute on those plans. I am still here. Um, but I know that some people might be here in this conversation and I've even had friends that I've known really well talk about people that commit suicide are just cowards and they just, they just feel like, you know, nothing's going to matter anyway. So they just end it and they just, they want the easy way out. And I can see that logic, but I can also see the, the opposite of that mindset where someone is willing to make such a final decision. Like I am done with all of this. I am done. Like that doesn't strike me as cowardice. I can see how it can be seen to that, but they're willing to say, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to decide to do this and I'm going to do it. Obviously I don't think that that's the right call. And we usually make those calls in times of turmoil, when our emotions are heightened and we are allowing our emotions to make decisions for us. Because there's always a path. There always is. There, the world is too diverse for there not to be a path. The world is too diverse with levels of problems with people all across the world that might make our problems seem kind of ridiculous kind of ridiculous. I've been in those parts of the world. I've seen those people with those problems and it's all about whatever whatever you're going through, whatever the hardest thing that you've gone through, that is the hardest thing you've ever gone through. Now, that might be you know, some people like to throw around that word that word privilege and everybody's experience is just so unique and individual, even though it can seem similar, the makeup in our brains, the makeup in our emotions and how they battle with each other. They're so unique. You can almost not even be able to describe them fully and have someone understand when someone says, I know how you feel. They probably don't and they don't have to, I don't expect them to know how I feel, but being able to be someone to listen and have someone lean on me in like bad times, not so great times. This is something that I just think I'm called to do. And a lot of it has to do with years ago when I was going through my divorce and I made these plans. So I'll go over those real quick. I'm, I'm an absolute open book. I've told this story to quite a few people and I use it as a reference to, to show people what you think you are going through right now it's not actual reality because when you're in a heightened emotional state, there's, there's, so much, there's so many clouds that are just over your head. You cannot think things thoroughly. You cannot think things all the way through and see some sort of future where you might be in a better spot. So divorce was horrendous, which everything's fine now, funny enough. But at that moment, you feel like, I felt like there is no way I was going to come out of this and there be anything positive for myself or for my kids. And my dad has some property up at Dale Hollow Lake, which is about an hour, 45 minutes from where I am now, which is where we were living roughly at the time. And I wanted to make sure, I wanted to make sure that this was going to be done and nothing would potentially bring me back because you do hear sometimes of people attempting suicide and they're unsuccessful. And sometimes they can come out of that perfectly fine physically and mentally and they make their way. And then sometimes people have a really hard life after that because of things that they've attempted. I want to make sure that that was not going to be the case. And I was going to go to my dad's property and there's kind of this hike. It's a couple miles from this cabin down to the lake but there's a lot of elevation change. It goes downhill quite a bit. And there's a series of waterfalls that probably not many people have even seen because it's on private property. There's no trail whatsoever, but I found this place just by exploring the area when I was, when I was younger. And this waterfall area is probably close to maybe a 50, maybe a 50 to 80 foot drop. It's hard to tell as I'm thinking about it in my mind, but it's probably around there. And it's just a sheer drop off. There's no like weird cascading steps type. It's just a straight drop off. Sometimes there's no water 
going this, over this waterfall at all. And sometimes it's just raging. It just depends on the, the rain or the water at the time. But I was going to go to this waterfall. I was going to sit at the edge of this cliff with my back towards the waterfall. And I'm kind of looking upstream, if you will. And at that point, I was, <laughs> I was going to use a handgun to do whatever needs to be done. We'll just leave it at that. And then at, if for some reason that did not do the job, I was going to fall anyway. So it was kind of like a, like an insurance policy. I was going to begin to fall. And as that was happening, I was going to, you know, use the firearm for whatever, to, whatever I needed to do. And there was a, there was this point where I would go up there all the time and I would just hang out because it's, it's a nice area. It's right near the lakes, pretty quiet, very low population and I remember being there one time, and I just remember this, this massively urgent, someone like grabbed me. And everybody, everybody who has talked about experiences with God and talking to them or receiving some sort of, you know, it's not like I sit someone at the table and we're going to have a conversation together. That's not how I see people talking to God, or at least myself. Um but a lot of people will reference God's like warm and inviting and like very soothing presence and trying to calm the situation. And I did not experience that, not even close. It was it was almost physical in nature in this just grasp of my shoulders, and it was just one word, and it was like wait, wait. I did not hear a booming voice and some gray bearded dude from the clouds appear into the sky and say, with these shining rays and angels singing and trumpets sounding, telling me to wait. No, it was just this very stern wait. And it was terrifying. It was not soothing. It was not comforting. It was more like it was more like a dad that like grabs you by the shoulders and say, Hey, you better straighten up right now because there's going to be some other consequences. That's the experience that I had personally. And that is what I have referenced since then. When I'm in a rough patch, when I'm in a down period, when I feel like I don't have a specific direction that I'm supposed to go, I just wait. And what I've been doing recently, I would say in the past couple of years, I've been creating projects for myself especially when I feel these feelings creeping in. Um, I create projects for myself to occupy my time. And I can see how some people would say that, well, you're just not dealing with these emotions. And it's like when people talk about, when I talk about my mom, and I do want to touch on that where I've had a podcast where I was talking about some of my experiences with my mom, talking about the negative ones, addiction, alcohol, substance abuse, um, but I know without a shadow of a doubt that my mom loved me to the absolute full fullest. She would have sacrificed anything for me. And she was always pursuing me all the time. She was always pursuing a relationship with me. And that's something that I value quite a bit. And that's something that I instill from her to my own kids. I'm constantly pursuing my own kids. I'm trying to be a very active parent, which is what she was. She was very active and proactive in being a part of my life. Um, but all these things are, you can say like, I'm not dealing with my mom's death or I'm not dealing with my divorce properly, or, or I'm not dealing with some sort of, you know, catastrophic issue that I'm dealing with my family or something like that. I'm just occupying my mind and not really dealing with it. I guess that's possible. But the problem is that when my mom was in hospice care, this was before she was even moved to like the final facility. As I was coming down out of the, it was a nursing home she was in. As I was coming out of the nursing home, I sat in my car for about 10 minutes after I just got done visiting with my mom. And I think I boohoo cried like a little baby for about five minutes straight. Seems like an eternity, but it was probably like five minutes. And it was one of those ugly cries where you're like, <laughs> or you're like sniffling like this and you can't even talk. But after that moment, I kind of just went on with life. 
I feel like I had my grieving moment at that point. And then my mom died probably three months or so after that. It was very sad, but I'd almost like accepted, yeah, this is going to happen. And when it does happen, you know, at least she'll be free of her pain and be at peace. And a lot of that just had to do with the time, the time passing. So I can go in here and sit on my couch every day after work for months and just sit there and be sad and be depressed. Or I can intentionally occupy my time. Getting my dog, Amos, he's a Belgian Malinois. He's an absolute psychopath. Getting him was a project because I wanted to teach him how to do things. I wanted to train him up. I wanted a dog that could go with me anywhere and he would listen to me. He would be imposing and intimidating and he would be a great conversation deterrent. And me and Amos worked every single day for, you know, hours a day, accumulatively. We worked for hours a day and now it's almost like maintenance mode. He just listens. He just does what he's supposed to do. And we just have to do little reminder sessions. But those hours and hours that I was putting into training him, I was learning how to be a dog trainer, so to speak. If, if any of my dog trainer friends are watching this, I'm not calling myself a dog trainer. I know two people who do this professionally, and I would just rip off of them. Hey, what should I do? How do you do it? And I ended up doing it and it went really well. So I'm not calling myself a dog trainer, but it's a skill that I chose to learn and I had to practice and put in the reps to do that. And while I was doing that, my brain did not have time to think about, you know, all the bad things that are going on in life. And that's where people use alcohol or drugs to subdue those same feelings. I would rather create projects. And I was just talking to somebody at the gym Last week, they're going through a breakup. They're not feeling too great. And we're talking about, um, we had this appointment that we're trying to get set up. And honestly, the appointment is like, it's a non-issue. It's just something that I was thinking about. And this person opened up and said that they were going through a breakup and they're just being really honest. Like sometimes you just get home, you just don't want to do anything. You just want to sit around and just kind of mope and feel like crap. And that's actually, that makes logical sense. That's what most people would do. And I would never fault anyone for doing that. What has worked for me in those moments is you got to just make stuff up sometimes. You got to make stuff up. You got to, you got to remodel your kitchen. You got to rip out your bathroom and put some new tile in. You got to do some new landscaping around your house. You need to paint your bedroom. You need to get a dog. Don't get a dog. I'll go ahead and tell you that right now. Don't get a dog. Because most people do not have the time or the patience or the occupational freedom to put work in like I have with Amos. It's not some brag, so just chill out. But those are the things that you can do. So whatever you can do to occupy your time, after a few months goes by, you'll be over it. I don't know if that's healthy or not. I think it's working for me. And I will continue to do it because I started implementing that process, that policy, probably close to three or four years ago. Because yeah, I would sit around and just binge Netflix. I would fall into YouTube black holes. That's probably what I would do more is just fall into these YouTube black holes of absolute ridiculous content. And <laughs> I just feel like this could be a good way to go about remediating some sort of thoughts where you feel like you have no direction, you have no hope, you feel no fulfillment out of whatever you're trying to get out of this life. These are all emotions. And I think everyone has to feel this at some point in their life. They have to, or they don't talk about it. Or maybe there are people that just don't care about much of anything. Uh, my wife is the most stoic being I've ever met. And I have to drag things out of her just to make sure hey, everything like everything good. She said, yeah, she's good. All she wants to do is just hang out with us, make good food, work out, and chill with the dogs. It's an awesome way to look at life. Sometimes I am very envious and jealous of her because she just seems like she's good most of the time. And I think that's kind of the curse of an entrepreneur or somebody that's very involved and committed to like 
high levels of personal development or high levels of personal psychosis, however you want to look at it. But a good tool for me is to create these projects. And the project that I kind of subconsciously created is a couple weeks after I had that terrifying moment in the woods where he told me to wait. Not even like a week after that is when I met Lindsay. And I was talking to Lindsay and telling her about my situation. Cause I was just like, I was just very open and straight to the point. I said, Hey, look, I'm going, I've been going through this divorce for a while and I have three kids. I work a blue collar job. I don't have any money. And eventually I think I want to open up a CrossFit gym. And I've already told this story a couple of times. So this is the, like the shortened version, but she was about to graduate with two degrees from MTSU. No college debt, no debt whatsoever. The world is at her fingertips. And for some reason she was like, cool. Sounds good. I like you. Let's do that. And I thought she was insane. I thought she was crazy. And she's still here. She's still cooking me food every single night and slowly rubbing the back of my neck every night as I fall asleep every single night. And it's just like, I know this life now. And I look back in those times where I felt like I had no hope and no direction and no way of getting out of it. And it's just time. So whenever you have these thoughts, you have to get out of the places around the people that could be reinforcing those thoughts and you need a project. Maybe you need to go back to school and learn something. Maybe you need to get a new job. Maybe you need to get another job where it just occupies your time because as your brain is working out these little problems of like, well, I want to get this tile and I want to put it in this pattern. Well, if I'm going to do that, I have to do this to the tub. And then all these things that you have to be working out that compound on each other, they give your brain things to work out. And then as you work them out, you are giving yourself evidence that you can work things out. When we ripped this house apart and Unfortunately, I'm not super motivated by doing this type of work anymore because I did a lot of it growing up. I'm not motivated about working on my cars. I'd rather just pay someone to do it. Um, but I remember having to work out all these scenarios of like, well, if we're going to work on this this day, we have to work this this day because this person's going to be here to do this on that and they need to be done with that before this happens and all these things. All these little micro problems that you're solving you, you will feel better about yourself. You will feel better about being able to overcome these tea tiny stupid things. Some of you might be laughing, but even things like, you know, well, I painted this wall with a flat finish, but I have kids and they're not little anymore. But when you paint a wall with flat paint and you get something on it, it's kind of a pain in the butt to clean off. So like, well, I just don't want to deal with that stuff. So I'm going to put a satin finish on these walls. It's a little shinier. Um, it's probably not the pick that most people would go, but guess what? It cleans up really well. I got dogs and I got kids and I fixed that problem by working out those little issues. Like, well, if I use this type of paint, then these problems won't be as big as problems as they used to be. Now that will compound because like, oh, well, I came up with a solution. This was a solution to a problem and I came up with it. And if, if you have to do that hundreds of times, hundreds of times, you have so much of a good reputation with yourself. Say, yeah, this sucks, but you know, I can fix that. Um, this, this lighting setup, two, three years ago, I didn't know anything about videography and I got very interested in it when I saw like a short documentary on a group from my church that was going to Chad and they were specializing in drilling water wells. And there's also an orphanage there that they fund and they take care of a bunch of kids over there and the artistry and filmmaking and all that stuff. It's super interesting to me, but I had no idea how any of it worked. So I just started with, Hey, I'm going to get a camera. Which camera should I get? Well, I'm going to watch this YouTube video and they're going to tell me which camera to get. So it was a project and I, I try to fill my life with as many little projects as possible that are leading towards something else. 
you know, setting up this whole filming studio. We're in my dining room right now. And I saw all of this six months ago. I knew the table was going to be right here. The microphone was going to get right here. I was going to have a Sony A6600 APS-C camera with a 55 millimeter lens because this amount of space will give me this amount of compression behind me and it'll make the frame look really good. Blurry background because it's a 1.4 aperture. All those little, and I'm saying this stuff and maybe you don't know anything about that mess, but it's kind of like figuring out, well, this is what I want and how do I make that a reality? And it, you have to make all the mistakes. You have to buy the wrong camera, the wrong lenses, the wrong lights, everything. You have to go through all that process and be like, well, I won't do it that way. I won't get that piece of gear because that's what happens when I try to use this. And you're giving yourself evidence of overcoming all these little problems. If I just told you exactly what to do, for one, it probably wouldn't be very um, implementable on your end because everybody's super different. And everybody has to work out their own problems. But if you feel like you don't have a direction, you're just going to be like, man, I just want to be done with this. I want to be over it. Those feelings are valid. I get it. They make sense. But the problem is, is those are feelings. And you're allowing feelings to make decisions for you. And what you need is discipline. What you need is projects. What you need is little tiny pieces of evidence to give yourself some sort of reaffirmed value. Oh, I am capable of insert whatever. And you feel like you don't have that, which is why you're trying to make these rash decisions of wanting to quit, wanting to be done because you feel like you just can't handle it. And you definitely can. You definitely can. I've seen so many people grow exponentially in the gym and learning that they are capable just by doing a burpee or doing a d one double under or deadlifting their body weight or deadlifting double their body weight, triple their body weight. This is why like physical fitness and all these things are just such a great metric for showing you, showing yourself that you matter and you can do something because I believe everyone has a job to do. I tell my kids this all the time. I think I drive them crazy. Everyone has a job to do. And sometimes I feel like we don't, we don't give ourselves enough credit because we can't, because we're not pursuing the job that has been given to us. When I'm talking to a client for two and a half hours after a class has ended, and they're giving me this entire backstory of why they feel worthless and why they feel like that they just cannot get over this thing I am not going to disengage that conversation until they think that they're good. I told Lindsay this many times. If I'm still at the gym and I'm, it's because I'm talking to someone. Shout out to my friend Nate from years ago. This had to have been 2013. I had like an hour and a half long conversation with him on a Friday night after class. And he was telling me about how his, his job sucks and he really wants to get into this and that and be his own boss and all this stuff. And today he is that. And he's referenced that conversation so many times, so many times over the years. And, you know, we'll talk every once in a while. Um, he's not at that gym anymore. I'm not at that gym anymore. But that night I remember having that conversation and I remember it was almost like nine 30. I feel like class was over at seven 30 and we talked forever and I was just telling, I was like, man, you can, you can do this. If you try this and this, you know, all these things you can try. But if you're not trying, you're not going to get anywhere. And I remember, I was like, God, it is late. It's getting late. And I have an hour and a half drive home because I was living like literally like across the state almost, it felt like. But there was no way I was going to say, all right, man. All right, Nate, I got to get out of here. It's good talking to you. Great job at class today and get out of there. If I would have cut that conversation off after five minutes. And I'm not saying that I made the difference. I'm saying that the, the task that I was given, that he gave me, I am obligated to fulfill that task, even if I'm inconvenienced. 
And when I do that over and over and over again, when I have these conversations over and over and over again, I feel like I'm keeping myself accountable to being obedient to the one that literally saved me and saved all of this. None of this would be here. The gym wouldn't be here. None of this stuff would be happening if I hadn't listened to him in the end. And when you can say that, like, hey, I listened and I did the thing and I came out of it, you can see yourself out of all this stuff. You really can. And you got to give yourself evidence for being able to get out of it, creating these little projects. You know, it's like our parents just tell us stuff to do all the time when we're kids. And then when we're 18 years old and we're adults, we're just like, all right, you got to go figure it out. Some people don't figure it out. They just kind of wander through life and they have a lot of ups and downs. And, you know, I just, that makes me think of my mom, just the up and downs of like constantly some sort of issue going on. Cause people just, they just feel like they can't figure it out because they never gave themselves an opportunity to figure it out. And if somebody has to figure out, like, you know what, I'm just intermittent fasting just really works for me. Or having six or seven really small little meals just works for me. If, if nobody tries that stuff, if you don't figure out what's not right for you, you can't give yourself evidence for being, you know, a capable person. You can be a good person all day long. But if you don't feel like you're capable, if you're competent, if you feel like you can provide some sort of purpose, yeah, you might not feel great about your existence here. So pairing those options with like, projects, getting a new job, you know, building a table, um, fixing your own car. You have to occupy your mind and your time with those things in order to get out of that slump. You have to. If you're thinking about, oh, what should, no, you got to pick something now and you got to go do it. And you can't be afraid of failure. You just got to do it. You got to say, oh, that's not, that's not the best way. So I'm just going to do it this other way. And you have to occupy your time until you go to sleep. And then when you wake up, those thoughts are going to be creeping in. You have to be so tired that you will fall asleep. You can't be staying up until 2 a.m. thinking about all this stuff. If you are, it's because you're not tired enough and you're not preoccupied with other things you're trying to fix in your life. So conditions may vary. My conditions, yours, everyone's. It's not fair and it doesn't matter. You have a choice to make. And you can either make it or not. And I hope that if you are having thoughts about taking your life or you know someone that is, you know, share the podcast or share your uh, perspective on what you have done to get out of that slump. And it's something I don't really talk about a whole lot because it's kind of a heavy subject. And I always feel like maybe I could have done this or that, but I didn't. And it's hindsight. So I'm trying to use my time to be a little more productive, to give people advice that have worked for me. If this is bad advice for you, then don't take it, whatever. I'm not trying to convince you of anything, but it worked for me and it has continued to work for me and I will continue to use it until it doesn't work for me. So I wish you well. We'll see you next week.